We have been talking about two Titans going at it to become Baylor's starting quarterback for 2024. But is there a third horse in this race that we have forgotten about? Potentially. This is Locked on Baylor. You are Locked on Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You heard the intro. Welcome to another episode of Locked on Baylor brought to you by Game Time Today. I am your host, Cam Stewart from ESPN Central Texas. Happy April 17th to you, and thank you for making it your first listen today and every day here on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. We got a diverse show going on today for sure. Heard from Mac Rhodes a little bit yesterday and about that coaching search and the wild week that he had. Um, the, we're still looking transfer portal and we're hearing more and more names in terms of guys Baylor has reached out to and specifically one that I highlighted and I want big time has narrowed his list down and Baylor is still on the list. But of course, maybe most pressingly, because Baylor's spring practice finale is this Saturday, is who's going to be playing quarterback for the Bears come August 31st of 2024 against Tarleton? When the center snaps it, is there going to be someone back there to catch it? I assume there will be. And this has been kind of the story of camp. And there are holes in, in the team, and there are you know new position coaches and, and guys that need to get up to speed and all of that, but... This is football, and all we care about as fans is the quarterback, right? Let alone that the offensive line is is going through a huge shift, and they were they had a poor year last year. Defensive line, same thing. New positional coach, uh, and and the group that really needs to get more on the quarterback and the defensive backfield. How strong that is! Haven't talked about yet that yet this spring because we care about the quarterback, and it's really been between a couple of. Guys who have transferred to Baylor over the last two years. Sawyer Robertson transferred in from Mississippi State before last season. Daquan Finn transferring in from Toledo back in January. The MAC player of the year last year. Uh, and that seems to be the race, right? Those two guys. Sawyer saw some time last year. Started a few games with Blake Shape and was hurt. Showed some good flashes. Of course, Daquan Finn comes in as you know the sexy new pick. Right, he was he was terrific at Toledo, which we all know is a step below the Big Twelve. But he was fantastic, and he had some big time Big Ten schools actually knocking on his door. As a matter of fact, uh, throughout this off season, and he chose Baylor. So that's the it, they're both there's excitement behind each one, right? We heard Dave Aranda talk about each one of those guys and what they're good at, right? Sawyer Robertson looks like more of a leader. He's hitting those timing patterns really well in this new offense, whereas Daquan Finn, he's the excitement. He, he can hit the deep balls, and he can extend plays with his legs. He's an 11th guy you have to defend out there, which hasn't always been the case for Baylor at quarterback since Gary Mohanan left after the 2021 season. So reasons to be excited about both of those guys, but is there a third one? because there was a quarterback that we saw last year in very limited doses who is still on the Baylor roster. And he's played, got some pretty good stats at the FCS level in, in his year at Northern Arizona. Here's what Dave Aranda had to say about RJ Martinez potentially and en entering his name into this starting quarterback race. You know, uh, the move, the ball periods, whether it's, uh, you know, seven on seven, like RJ's, Probably his his arm talent might be the best in the room of all of it, and I think like uh, for him to get over, you know, here's the view of it, here's the look, and then here's this all this stuff that's not what it looked like to kind of get past that point. I think is the one thing he's kind of fighting through, but it's just a pure passer. Uh, RJ probably has the be the most natural talent that way, and so we're trying to get him through the the thing of it looked like this, but it ended up, ended up being that which. R.J. Martinez might have the best arm talent of all of them. Really? Now, that is surprising because Sawyer Robertson has some arm talent. We know Daquan Finn has some arm talent. And here I've got Dave Aranda telling me R.J. might be the best thrower of all of them. And he did, I mean, prove that at a lower level at Northern Arizona, but played in 19 games there, threw for 
like 4,600 yards, 30 touchdowns in that time. Like he was chucking it all over the yard. I mean, he had some games where he was throwing it 50, 55 times, and, you know, completing 30 or 40 of them, three touchdowns, four touchdowns, no picks. Like he was a, he was a big time player. Um, in fact, he was the big skies. I was, I had to look up what that conference was the big sky, uh, conference freshman of the year and finished sixth in the nation's top FCS freshman award. That's the Jerry Rice award. Um, that like, that's nothing to totally scoff at, especially for Baylor being three and nine a year ago. Right. We'll, we'll take that. Um, so can RJ actually ascend to this spot? That might be a bridge too far right now uh, because of what Dave also said in there is that basically when you get out there, like he, he's great in the film room and can throw the, chuck the ball a country mile, but when you're out there and you're disguising coverages and potentially bringing blitzes and things like that, that that's where, and the game speeds up, that's where it starts to become a problem for RJ Martinez. And that, that's what that sounds like there, and obviously that's, that's something that a is a big step up from the FCS to the FBS power five level. Um, that's one thing. And B it's, it's, it's a problem for most quarterbacks this time of year <laughs> before you get to a spring game. Um, that's not an uncommon problem, but he is a guy who took some snaps last year. Nothing, nothing to write home about, but at least has ran in this offense. Um, and he's a guy that will do, do a lot with having, you know, fall camp as well. And and what this tells me is RJ can come in and be a backup quarterback for you, the backup quarterback for you. And I say that because, and I, I have no intel on this situation, but the transfer portal opens two days after the spring game. You know, um, and so there's always that that worry that Dave Aranda is going to name a starter and whoever's not the starter is going to hit the portal, especially if it is Sawyer Robertson that's starting and Daquan Finn's like, bro, I, I had other offers, man. I, I, and I've got one year left. I'm not, I'm not sitting here to be a backup. That's totally understandable. He could put his name in there, you know? So there is that fear. There's, there's nothing leading me towards that's going to happen, but there is that fear. And if that happens, it sounds like you have a, very capable backup in RJ Martinez, which is something you cannot take lightly, especially if you're a Baylor fan, because it seems like the last decade or so, there's been need for a backup quarterback at some point every year. Guys get hurt. Sometimes the fans want to throw in the backup quarterback all the time. Like it happens. It happens. Sawyer is the backup last year, I think got like meaningful. I mean, I think he started four games. So, like, you need to have someone who is as capable backup in there. I, I It's still down to Sawyer Robertson and Daquan Finn for me, but to hear these things about RJ Martinez shows that he is growing and could be a, a capable backup if something were to go wrong um, or if someone were to hit the portal or if all hell breaks loose and two quarterbacks ahead of him get hurt. Um, we've seen that at Baylor before. Uh, we've seen that in college football before. That, that could happens. So to hear that he does like we don't get to see it on a day-to-day -day basis. We definitely don't see it in the game, but to hear that he does have that arm talent. Again, Dave Dave did not that is off the soundbite that I gave last week where he broke down the two other quarterbacks, Finn and Sawyer Robertson. So he did not need to mention RJ Martinez in there, which leads me to believe he might be telling the truth there in that RJ might well have, you know, the the best arm talent of any of these guys. So that's a positive. All right, look, we've all been there, okay? Either as a player or as a fan, and it's it's halftime, and the scoreboard, it ain't looking too good. You're feeling low, not sure that you or your team can pull out a win. Trust me, I felt that a lot. That's when you dig deep, though. That's when you lift your head up and you say to yourself, it's time to get back in this game. Pull off some bank heists and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's right, because I'm talking about the smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go. It lets you complete, compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies, your group chat. There is so much to do. Okay, you can play on these countless dynamic Monopoly boards. You can make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball. Miley Cyrus, that stuff. 
stuff and charge other players rent for your properties. You can even work with, with your friends to crack open community chess in its tournaments to get extra awards and climb the leaderboard. So get back out there put on your game face and download Monopoly Go for free at the App Store or on Google Play. Again, that's Monopoly Go. Download for free on the App Store or on Google Play. Got to hear from Mac Rhodes Tuesday on the Matt Mosley Show. Weekdays, 3 to 6, you can hear Matt and myself on that program on ESPN Central Texas and SendTechSportsFans.com. Mac came on the show, and really what we wanted to hear, of course, was about the hectic week last week, you know, because we we all went through it in our own way, the chaos of whether Scott Drew was going to stay or whether he was going to go. We didn't know. And it got hairy there for a second, right? And think of the, the stress you went through. Multiply that by about 10,000, and that's what was going through Mac Rose's head because this could have been a disaster for the athletic department had Scott Drew left. We all knew that. And I, I gave a lot of credit to Mac in this administration, and I still will, of the fact that he gave Scott Drew a dream job before the 11th hour. He gave Scott a tough job to leave before people were asking him to leave. You know, he didn't have to swoop in and give him a, a lifetime contract or a huge extension or, or a, you know, double his salary. He didn't have to do that. He already had a great salary, he had a great contract, he had great people around him. He had awesome facilities and great coaches that were paid handsomely. Mac gave him that before the 11th hour. And I'll still credit him for that. But of course, we needed to ask, like, Mac, what, what was this week like? And it's it's trying to balance all these things of trying to keep Scott around and, and give him that final sell to keep him there versus having a contingency plan like. We're also, we're talking about mid-April here. If Scott leaves, you need to have someone like you're confident and ready to go within a couple of days. You don't, you don't have weeks, you have days in this scenario. And Mac kind of took us through what that, what those couple of days and what those two tracks were like. You have to have both, both paths going forward parallel. You know, the, the one path, you know, trying to be the, the, the best colleague, the best friend, um, resource that you can for for scott and and certainly you know uh doing your best to to advocate for for him to stay and then you know the other the other pathway is you've got to be ready to go and uh if you know god called him to go to uh, if god called him and kelly and and um uh, and the and the kids to go to go to kentucky then we needed to be be ready and uh so you know, I think I can say, you know, with certainty that that Thursday morning, if the call would have been been different, um, we were lined up, ready to go, and um, would have been meeting with with uh, with a candidate as as early as you know that that late afternoon, early evening. So you've got to be able to run out both. And boy, was he ready to go! <laughs> so Scott announces that he's coming back on Thursday morning. Max says in there. We were going to have someone in potentially for an interview that afternoon, um, which is it, it's it is such a wild balance, right? Because you're doing everything to keep Scott Drew around, everything, but you do have to think about that in the back of your mind. And Mac was ready, and I Mac takes a lot of crap, and I I don't understand a lot of it. Uh, again, if if Scott had left and you're talking about Kim Mulkey and Scott Drew both having left, then then I understand the criticism would fall on the athletic director there. But again, he has given his coaches a terrific platform. And by that, I mean, you know, not just, you know, joy, Jesus, others, yourself, but like a great foundation on which to be a successful coach and a, a culture within the athletics program that is still pretty darn good. <laughs> like pretty good. Like most schools would would envy the kind of culture that Baylor has around athletics, uh, especially when you look away from the football record, right? And I, I just found it fascinating that he was open enough to say, yeah, I, I had someone ready, ready to at least come in and talk. And I, I do wonder who that was, right? We, we kind of speculated on this last week. There's no shortage of, of good candidates that, that Baylor could have called and had in that afternoon, you know, whether it's 
Jerome Tang or Grant McCasland or John Jacobs. He, even John Jacobs, a guy who had just taken the head coaching job at FAU, um, is, is someone who's held in really high regards by not just the other assistants, but the athletic department as a whole. Uh, we've heard Mac talk about him in the past. Of course, he's, you know, said great things about Jerome Tang, who was working on the staff when Mac was there too. But um, like everyone loves Jacus and thinks he is, you know, the, the X's and O's genius that we know him to be. So I, I found that intriguing of who that was going to be. You know, the first thing that popped in for me was Tang uh, because he, he did, does have a lead eight success in, in the big 12 and was the longest serving um, assistant for Scott drew. But if he had said no, and it was Grant McCasland, you'd still be living pretty good. If they both said no, and it was John Jacobs, you'd still be living pretty good, pretty good. Um, and again, Mac, you know, give him the crap that you want, but he pays the assistant coaches really well. And so a, that's a place they'd like to come back to once they leave, but also B, you might've been able to retain a good bit of your staff, uh, which is very uncommon. Uh, I think you would have been able to keep some of those guys. If you were able to, able to bring in Tang or Jacobs or even someone like McCaslin who hadn't worked with a lot of them. Uh, I think you would have been in a, a good spot, a good spot. And they were athletics is in a good spot. Um, all told if Scott drew leaves. Yeah. That's a different picture that we would need to talk about, but I think overall it's in a, it's in a fine spot. Um, of course, football needs to get better, but that's that's a different that's a different kind of topic. But I, I did I was intrigued by that, by how he had to use those two tracks and who he would have gone after. And it kind of got me thinking, you know, not just after he said it, but like throughout last week too, is like Baylor, Baylor basketball. I think it it could well be a top fifth ten or fifteen job in all of college basketball. You know, I, I understand it's not the prestige that Indiana and UCLA have, but like it's a it's a good spot to be in right now. I mean, one thing we talked about with the Kentucky search was the the vipers of that fan base, right? And that comes with all the blue blood fan bases. Baylor does not have that. Let's be honest, people. It, it does not have the Viper fans uh, for sure. It's a good support. I don't think it's, you know, one of the top five or 10 fan bases in all of America. It's pretty good. Pretty good, all told. Um, but that that does play into things, that you have a fan base that's going to support you. You have an administration that's going to support you, but they're also not going to be putting for sale signs on your lawn. Uh, that That is something. You've got tremendous facilities, not the least of which being the, the Foster Pavilion. I think one of the great... Uh, home court advantages in the country last year. Once we got that thing going in January, I, I love the place. I know Scott does. Um, and again, the talent pool around here, like Baylor is a name now in college basketball. There's a reason why they have a lottery pick every year and why they're getting these five-star guys all the time now. Like it is a place people want to go and want to be. And it has every opportunity to be a final four team year in, year out now. And that is, you know, something that I think a lot of Baylor fans are still getting used to. And a lot of college basketball fans are still getting used to about Baylor. Because if I, I most college basketball fans outside of our realm, if they had just heard what I had said about Baylor being a top 10 or 15 job, they'd be like, turning this off. This guy's crazy. Stupid Homer doesn't know anything. But like, I might be stupid. But I think this one isn't that far off. You know, like, and I would think of it in the same way you would think about University of Houston, which a lot of people would say, yeah, that's that's a top 10 job in college basketball right now. These two programs are very similar, very similar. And, you know, there'll be some Cougs in there who are talking about all the sweet 16s they've made. But, like, you're talking about Final Fours. They've each been to one the last couple of years, last five years. Baylor's got a national championship. They win more than just about anybody in college basketball over that span. They've had terrific players. Uh, Baylor's had lottery picks. So if you think that Houston is a top 10 or top 15 job, <clears throat> I think you have to put Baylor in there too. We're not talking about all time. We're talking about the year 2024. And <clears throat> I think I think you have to think of Baylor 
<clears throat> excuse me, I think you have to think of Bayor in that regard as we speak here on April 17th of 2024, for sure. All right, new sponsor on today's video. That is our friends over at Yahoo Finance. All right, let's get straight to the point. <clears throat> you want to grow your portfolio to deal with the rising costs of inflation, pay off your debt, pay off your mortgage, pretty much anything standing in the way of you and your financial freedom, right? Okay. With Yahoo Finance, you can get access to the news, the data, and tools that you need in order to help you reach that financial freedom. We all have that. And we want you to go and reach that, okay? So for more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. Whether you're a seasoned investor or you're looking for that extra guidance like me, Yahoo Finance gives you all the tools and data you need in one place. They are the number one finance destination, producing a holistic look at the financial news cycle, including the breaking news, editorial perspectives, analyst ratings, independent research, customizable charts, and so much more. So securely link your brokerage accounts for a unified view of your wealth, including that 401k and other investments. So for comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com, the number one financial destination. That's yahoofinance.com. You all know it, and we're about to hit football portal season again come next week, but we're heavily into basketball portal uh, season. And one of the guys, I think the first one I toted as someone that Baylor needs to go after hard in the portal is Rutgers center Cliff Amori. And that came on early in the process. That was the week Baylor got knocked out of the tournament. They had contacted Cliff Amori, and then it was kind of radio silence for a while. Uh, I was like checking the last couple of weeks to be like, do we know that this is, you know, the right, like, do we know that he's still in the portal? Did he commit very quietly and no one really talked about it? Uh, no, he is still uncommitted. He is still looking. And in fact, he has narrowed down his search and narrowed of course is relative because he has narrowed his search down to 12 teams. Okay. And those teams are Mississippi State, St. John's, Georgia, Oregon, Washington, Alabama, Georgetown, Georgia Tech, Kansas State, UCLA, North Carolina, and the reason why he's on this show, Baylor. Baylor's still in that fold. I know it's 12. That's a lot. Uh, but they are still, they have not been knocked out yet. And there's not a lot of Big 12 in there. Kansas State. Uh, I believe being the the only one. So like you're you're in a good spot right there, right? I was right about that. Yes, they're the only one. Um, and so now it's tete a tete. Scott Drew, Jerome Tang going for Cliff Amori, and a lot of others in there. Um, I don't know what Baylor's chances are in this one in twelve. I would say, um, but they are still in this. They they need him, and. I don't know how much he needs us, but he could see a good track record of all Big 12 caliber and awarded big men, uh, international big men, and the way that Baylor really can use the post game. Maybe that works in their favor because when John Jacobs came, came aboard, they did the European ball screen and their offense completely changed for the better. But maybe you see a lot more post ups, and that's what this kid can do. I mean, he, he's not necessarily a back to the basket guy because there's only one of those in college basketball, and it's Zach Eady. And I, he's he's a guy who can play above the rim. He can play with a ton of grit. Uh, takes a lot of pride in the defensive side of the ball. Um, he he led the Big Ten in blocks this year. Again, a league with Zach Eady in it um, and was right up there with rebounds as well. Terrific player. Um, I've already done a YouTube breakdown on that, on that, uh, on his game for if you want the full picture, but he's got the grit and the athleticism to be a terrific Baylor center. The ones we, or, or power forward, which we have seen in the past. You know, I see it. I said, You've got a little bit of everything in him. You see a little bit of Rico Gathers. You see a little bit of Mark Vidal. You see a little bit of Jonathan John Machacho. You'll see a little bit of Eve Misi. There's factors of all of those guys going into Cliff Amori. Now, I, I don't have a ton of insight on the rest of these teams. I will say, North Carolina is trying to replace Armando Baycott. 
that's tough. That's a tough, <laughs> that's a tough competition. North Carolina is still, you know, one of the great college basketball factories. It's probably my least favorite team in college basketball. Uh, but they they are still an absolute no doubt blue blood. Um, they've got a lot of banners hanging in the rafters at the Dean Dome, and they're one of the the most passionate college basketball fan bases. Um when they're not talking about their wine and cheese and wearing their Argyle, a lot of them are pretty good fans. And uh, that's, that's the one that that kind of worries me uh, because the others, you know, there are some good plucky teams in there. Of course, Kansas state with Jerome Tang, who wouldn't want to go and play there. Um, that's a good spot. Um, St. John's is, is riding with this Rick Patino thing. They were almost in the tournament last year, New York city, all that stuff. But to me, I, I think Baylor and North Carolina have just as good a shot as any, um, what I one thing I do really like about Cliff, he keeps Christ in the center. He's he's he is right with the Lord, and Jesus others yourself. That's the thing around here at Bay, where you're not going to get as much of that at UNC or any of those other schools, except maybe St. John's. Um, good God fearing man like Rick Pitino. Anyway, uh, they're still in it. I, I I would love to keep updating this, hopefully in a positive manner, because I think he would be a fantastic fit for Baylor. Uh, who can really use his skills and and his grit and probably his leadership as well uh, going into next year to try and get past the round of 32. That's going to be the obsessive focus next year is Sweet 16, and then everything beyond that will hopefully be gravy. Anyway, let me know what you think about Cliff Amore. Drop that down in the comment section below, whether he's something that Bayward needs, or is RJ Martinez a viable option in this quarterback race? Could we see him usurp one of these two guys? Drop that down in the comments below. And, of course, what Mac Rhodes had to go through this week. Who do you think that guy would have been? Because I'm intrigued to hear what the fans think of who that call would have been, who that interview would have been that Thursday afternoon. Drop that down in the comments below. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you for making it your first listen today and every day. We'll be back tomorrow with your favorite show, Locked on Baylor.